Welcome back to Sikhstan, the national broadcasting station coming at you live from the Olympic Village. The office might look a little bit different to the other little places that people have at their places, but we've just been ostracised due to political reasons, which is... It's a disgrace, really. Which is part of today's video, interestingly enough, which we're just going to expose some secrets, I think. So, two disclaimers before we get into this video, okay? So, one, the title of the video does have Chinese weightlifting in the name. However, we are not ragging on Chinese weightlifting in any way in particular. They're just a great example over the last few days of something that's highlighted. So we're not ragging on Chinese weightlifting. If you are a Chinese fanboy, please don't come at us. Do leave comments. Feel free to leave comments because they're great for the algorithm. But if you are a fanboy of Chinese weightlifting and this bothers you for some reason, please don't let us know. We just don't care. We're not ragging on them in particular. We don't have a horse in the game. We don't have a stake in the game. We don't have any Irish lifters at the Olympics. There was 116 Irish athletes at the Olympics, a record yeah. number for Ireland. A lot of young talents, which is great to see. So we're, this this is true for all sports, the stuff we're going to talk about. But it is um, primarily we're coming at this from a weightlifting perspective because it is also more first-hand knowledge, although we do have some experience in other sports. Two, the second disclaimer we have is we're not arguing for or against the morality of doping here. So we're not talking about, well, they're all on drugs, so... Blah, 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 you know, insert, they might as well do it too. So this isn't what this video is about as usual. Uh, you're actually breathing really loudly. It's There's no way the mic can hear it. Su no, but I can hear it and it's super distracting. But you don't sure, breathe like this you, when we're sitting there, like. But it doesn't need to be distracting you. You but just it don't is, need to. No, but it is distracting. It's so distracting. So the second disclaimer then is that we're not arguing for the morality of doping. We're not for or against it. This is simply just the reality of the situation as it stands right now or as good as we can explain it to people. So if you think you know what you already know, you can never learn something new, which is basically something similar to what Epitis had said. So if you think you already know the facts of the situation, we get some comments sometimes like this saying not all athletes are on drugs. Uh, that might be true some of the time, but most of the time that is not true for the Olympics. So we're just going to run you through a couple of different scenarios that athletes are usually in or tiers that these athletes are in at the Olympics in regards to their doping situation. So tier one, we have athletes who do not or cannot dope. These are athletes who choose through moral reasons, very admirably, choose not to dope even if they had the access to. Now these athletes are actually pretty few and far between. There's a lot of athletes who cannot dope via uh, they lack the access financially, politically, or both of the above to put them in a, in a position where they could dope. I think where you often find people assuming their countries flow into these kind of silos is they'll look at a country like the US or the UK or even Ireland and they'll say these athletes get tested so regularly. So there's they might have 20 tests a year or 30 tests a year. And assume that that means the athlete is immediately clean. Like what you need to think about before you start any of that is you need to look at known dopers in the past, what they have done and how often they've been tested. So really famously, Lance Armstrong was over a thousand drug tests in like a certain period of his career when he was on drugs the entire time. So just because an American weightlifter says, oh, I've been tested 20 times in the last year doesn't mean they're not doping it just means they're still getting tested while possibly passing those tests what well, i was kind of highlighting there is that there is there can be different athletes within the country who may not be able to do what other athletes can do in particular sports essentially so if we move on to tier two so these are athletes who pass drug tests via financial means so much be small time bribery or more than likely good chemistry essentially so they have access to someone be it in-house or they outsource their intelligence to other places, uh, other individuals who help people pass drug tests via good chemistry and good means of use of this chemistry, good drug selection and a variety of different factors. So most athletes, most athletes across the world who do dope at the Olympics or any other international sports typically fall into tier two. So this kind of category where they will have individuals who are in-house via their kind of their team or their club or a history of through their sport so it goes back of maybe a couple of years where coaches will understand the system they not may not be chemists or biochemists themselves or uh, analytical chemists in any means but they understand the drug situation enough whereby for example in their particular country the internal drug system may be pretty apathetic towards testing athletes. It may not be proactively helping those athletes test, pass drug tests, but they may understand that system then when they do go to a scenario where they will end up being testing, for example, at the Olympics. So tier two athletes, 
still have a lot of skill involved in it. Well, it might be nefarious skills. It may be morally reprehensible skills from certain people's point of view, especially tier one athletes who choose not to dope. But these tier two athletes are people who uh, basically in a kind of a smaller scenario, a smaller circle dope via their own means by financially passing some drug tests or paying other people to help them pass these drug tests. This for most people is where they imagine the kind of evil athlete coming into it. You know, they're like the dirty cheater. They're doing something that nobody else is doing. They kind of go out and get it on their own because they may or may not be getting backed by a federation or a team or an entire country. But this is the reality of most of the people at the Olympic Games now who are doping are in this position. So it mightn't be their choice or it might be their choice. They're probably getting help from other people. And then, as Owen said, it's a combination of things, whether that's the chemistry and the washout times, whether that's masking agents or whether it's like a small time bribe to an in-country official. When you start looking at where these people get caught or where dopers get caught is you'll see a retroactive drugs test being done on like a host of samples like the example of the weightlifters in Rio getting caught when we have small time changes in testing protocols testing techniques different metabolites that they identify you can suddenly get something that a whole host of nations would think would only last for a certain amount of time like an example of stenazenol might only last for a number of days suddenly that test gets amplified or they increase their ability to pick up metabolites further out from competition and now you suddenly get a whole host of retroactive positive tests. In the case of like some of the newer metabolites people have found, if you want to hear more about that, you should go, there's Anti-Doping Science had a, has a podcast. He has some really, really good stuff on like the development of tests, how those tests were brought about. And if you wanted to look more into it, that's a great place to go. Interestingly about part tier two athletes is there's a possibility that the entire country could actually be complicit, right? But when we move on to tier three athletes, you'll see that it is not necessarily enough for the entire country to be complicit in the doping practices. So tier three athletes are countries where they have enough political clout via people in positions of power or simply that a country has enough power over the governing bodies to ensure that their athletes will never test positive. Uh, some people may kind of think, you know, this sounds conspiracy theory, but we know for a fact this happens. Uh, China, for example, is a great example of this. We've I've heard from different sources where by Chinese athletes uh, don't necessarily pass drug tests through nefarious means or chemistry. They essentially have enough political clout, enough political backing, whereby it's, there is insurance that the political the athletes will never test positive. So we do hear people talking about the super advanced drugs Chinese athletes are on, maybe their gene doping, for example. It's very, very unlikely that it is happening right now for these athletes of these ages. Most likely what's happening, and this is from different sources, we've heard this, and you can extrapolate this from views of politics as you zoomed out higher. So essentially, athletes, not just China, but other athletes have scenarios like this. It's very, very likely USA in certain scenarios have enough political power over the sports whereby they can exert enough force to ensure a positive drug test will go away. So this is not necessarily just bribery, for example. This is not just a form of kind of bribing drug testers individual. This would ascend to higher levels of sports whereby this would never even get to place. So essentially what these athletes have in tier three is, while there is kind of shades of gray across this, tier two have more advantages over tier one as they're taking drugs to a certain point of the year. Tier two example, athletes will have to stop taking drugs a certain period out from competition unless they discovered a particular drug that they could take to competition. But a lot of times you'll see people's performance, specifically in weightlifting, for example, two months ago, they'll clean and jerk the world records. And then four, six, seven, eight weeks later, we'll see that their performance drops drops off massively. Whereas for our tier three athletes, again, they have a further advantage. So they can continue to take their drugs right up to competition and ensure sometimes even the day of competition, potentially, they can ensure then that their athletes would, for example, never end up testing positive and they get a huge performance increase. So they'd never have that taper off period. Most notably in weightlifting, the last three days you can see for the last few days for example you can see the chinese male athletes are physically in phenomenal condition the weights they're lifting are, are simply obnoxious in relation to their competitors in most scenarios 
you see, for example, Chen Lujen made a something like an 11 kilo jump for his final clean and jerk and absolutely demolished the, the, the clean and jerk. You see there's that kind of aggression in that barbell where they just simply destroy it. And you see these in athletes in their off season when they're heavily doped, they have this kind of tenacity into in they put into the barbell, this kind of power that you don't see, you do see from athletes or you don't see from athletes who've taper off their drugs earlier due to being in kind of a tier two athlete. So that's kind of how we categorize them. Interestingly enough, you can have tier, you can have an entire system complicit entire country complicit with a doping system but not have the power for tier three for example russia is a great example of this right so in the icarus documentary we saw the very nefarious and very kind of almost hilarious physical means by which they avoided the drug test by just simply replacing an athlete's piss with clean piss so we had these athletes while the entire country was complicit they believed they went to the very top with vladimir putin being complicit in this doping system they, however, did not have the political means to encourage the testers or the Olympic Committee to make sure they didn't test positive. Whereas, for example, Ben Johnson tested positive in the 1988 Olympics. Who was the American dude? Uh, what's the it's sprinter? A Very famous sprinter. Um, Alex is editing this video, so Alex will know exactly we're talking about as soon as the sprinter. He... Let me just look it up here. Yeah, I do. Oh my God, everyone knows his name. You know me, mm, do you? I know. Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis. So a great example of this was, for example, Ben Johnson tested a positive at the 1988 Olympics. And the rumors were that Carl Lewis's sample was held off until the Olympics was over. And then it was basically shoved away and there was no positive test for Carl Lewis. This recently, if you listen to Gregory Rochensov's book, he was aware of this at the time during the 1988 Olympics. He was aware of this carry on with Carl Lewis's sample. It was uh, a fairly open secret within the kind of Olympic circles, apparently at the time, that Carl Lewis's sample was just shoved aside, even though he also tested positive for metabolites for anti-doping substances. So it's not just China, but it varies across certain countries. And it is something going from tier one to tier three. The difference in performance can be literally 20% given how soon you might be able to keep taking particular drugs up into an event. I think one of the last things to note about like tier three countries is a lot of the time you're not looking for like a really, really like rich nation or something like that. When you look for the example of like North Korea, you have a country who's literally on its knees, but due to the fact of their political surroundings, no drug tester is allowed into the country. And when a drug tester does allow or are allowed in country, they obviously can't find the people they're looking for. So it's like people often think of the tier three athlete where they have this like political clout or political situation that allows them to dope. It's not necessarily just the power of the country itself, but it's the political situation in which they exist. Another example of this could be you'll see phenomenal uh, performances by Iranian lifters. You will very, very, very rarely get a US or a, a UCADA or a WADA uh employee being allowed into the country when they are allowed in country if they're either from the us or from the uk they'll have to have like a guide with them the whole time so it's not like they can actually go around and check out training facilities it's not like they can actually go to a, a house uh unaccompanied they will have someone holding their hand the whole time so this is like the level where you can basically do whatever you want so then we, you kind of have that merging it so tier two the internal comp climate for drug testing would be non-existent but then they, like Dara saying, the Iranians probably wouldn't have a scenario where they could influence positively for their own athletes outside of this, where we do sometimes see Iranian athletes test positive. However, with good chemistry and good knowledge, that period where they're not drug tested for most of the training year only to, when they go to competitions can make a massive difference if the correct knowledge is applied. Uh, a great example for weightlifters in tier three. So this is something we were told from a couple of different sources, but a very famous case of uh, Ilya Ilian who tested positive. Ilya rocked up the competitions hot as fuck. He rocked up juicy as fuck, lifting weights that were phenomenal, right? And he lifted them in a fashion that would let you think he's got to be on drugs right now. He didn't taper off at any point. He is in un incredible shape. And the rumors were, and it came from different sources, and some of them are very believable sources, was that Ilya had essentially political power due to a member of the Kazakhstani Federation being in a particular place in the IWF. And then... This is kind of where the rumors split. One was that Thomas Ajan was twisting the Kazakhstan Federation's... Um, what do people twist? Twisting their twisting nipples? Twisting their arm. 
that sounds a lot more appropriate twisting people's arm before and a uh, so preceding seeing the next olympics to essentially get more cash from them for whatever reasons kazakhstan may have not paid that or may have not had enough cash and then essentially it was uh, thomas ajan may daily attest positive essentially retrospectively or one of the other rumors which is very as likely as possible is the aoc was twisting thomas ajan's arm not nipples to ensure a positive or to kind of milk weightlifting for more money and essentially the IOC was saying look if you don't pay up or give us more money we're going to get rid of your star boys and essentially it was one of those now look there's a certain athlete snatching 220 kilos in the training hall right now for whatever means we have no idea about individual athletes but you can make your own extrapolations based on this look if this made you kind of annoyed or angry and you're like not everyone's on drugs and you're like the, the evidence is there in real terms of like positive drug tests and the fair multiple scandals drugs yeah, there's drug yeah, scandals yeah. every year these are just the reality of the situation we're not accusing anyone essentially this is just some guesswork and some insider knowledge and some evidence that's publicly available for everyone so this is just a little bit more information on why certain athletes might show up to competition and look really shit compared to a few weeks ago yeah. whereas others show up and they are melting the bar in their hand so zach was actually supposed to join us on this but due to the absolute confuckery of the ioc he wasn't able to watch the weightlifting in america from his true legal means he couldn't watch it on discovery plus so i know zach is making a go at going fucking ham on youtube so zach if you want to do a little reaction to this and give us your thoughts still we'd be more than happy to hear what you have to say um and alex is editing this one so by the way we're trialing out a new editor. Alex is a great editor. We just want to make sure if everything works for us and it works for him. So if you watch this video and you're like, wow, this is a lot more pleasurable viewing experience, let us know in the comments because we'd like to see because everyone involved would appreciate some feedback. So thanks for watching. Anything add fits? No, thanks very much for watching. Uh, I know we said we don't care about your opinion if you're like fanboying over someone and you're disappointed because Gareth said Lasher or CJ Cummins are on gear. <laughs> <laughs> but do put it in the comments below because it does really help us out. Yeah. Again, even if we do talk about these athletes, it's not like they're yeah, terrible yeah, athletes. Yeah. It's just, look, this is probably what's happening with this particular athlete. And there we go. Thanks, guys.